Hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining us, and we are sorry that you've once again found yourself stuck in Hagard. My name is Kevin Bradley. I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Kevin Gallagher. A little bit of an unfamiliar background for me. I'm trying out a new spot to record in because the Wi-Fi in the closet is terrible. And it's, it's kind just... of kind of a sultry little inviting environment. It's kind of like sexy. Like it's like, hey there, Kev, how you doing? Just no no big yeah, deal. No, just, just like just chill. Bedroom in the background. <laughs> yeah, we could you just should... watch we, we don't need to do it. We could just watch movies or whatever. You should, <laughs> like, you should be like sprawled out on the bed in like a robe with your hand behind your head or, or something. Reynolds style, just like <laughs> laid out. Style. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What so we're going to get into the news, but before we do, a few, like, uh, few shout-outs. First of all, no judges needed. Uh, day one friends of the show and your number one ally in the battle of looking like a schlub on the mat. You can go to them to get all of your rash guard and gi needs met looking fly as hell. And they got some pieces to wear outside the gym, like hoodies and t-shirts. Again, that's www.nojudgesneeded.com. And uh, we don't have a promo code with them yet, but like we're never gonna not shout them out because they're the dope, they're the best, it's coming. They're the best in the game. Coming. Also, uh, new friends of the show, Off Colony. They've been uh, we've been loving their stuff for a minute now. Uh, go also, check out. If you need a tattoo and you're in the area or you're not in the area, the owner of Off Colony is Philip Holt, and he is without question probably not even no exaggeration, maybe top five tattoo artists in America. Definitely one of the top art tattoo artists in Florida. So if you're in the area in Tampa and you need a tattoo done, hit my brother up. He is amazing. That just makes you, that kind of makes me want to watch that show Inked or Ink Master. <laughs> or Ink yeah, Master. Like the, <laughs> the he could he could be one of the guest judges on Ink Master. That's how good he is. He's amazing. Oh hell yeah. Well, I'll I'll hit him up for my first tattoo, maybe, because I still don't have I'll one. You, is it gonna be my face? Yeah, just, exactly. Just, just lie to me and tell me. It, it was is. supposed to be it was supposed to be a surprise, Kev. <laughs> just lie to me and tell me. <laughs> <this>. <laughs> It's just going to be Gallagher on my back like it's a jersey. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And last little shout out. We always have to send it up to official K-Guard Beatmaster, Chris Noonan. Uh, He supplies all the music that you hear on all the stuff we we do here at Under Pressure TV. So, Chris, thank you very much. He's also got a school out here in Jersey, the Hive Martial Arts Academy, with locations in Manahawkin, and Cream Ridge. A few of his guys just had a great showing at a tournament. Uh, so congrats, Chris. Congrats, uh, Morgan, and all the guys that competed. And uh, hope to see you soon. But uh, yeah, we got to get into the news, don't we? Uh, but actually, first, I want to ask you about the John Calstein seminar you attended. Oh, man. Like, uh, John's awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, this is the second seminar I've been to with John. And, uh, you know, my leg lock game. People always talk about I'm a leg lock guy, and I guess I kind of am. I don't really know. I don't want to say that. I never like to lose that lingo, but I would consider myself to be an ever evolving leg lock uh, uh, instructor or you know practitioner. I consider myself to be a decent brown belt level at the leg yeah. lock game. So I'm always evolving and I'm always learning new things. And man, Kallenstein is just such a he has such a good knowledge of the mechanics of leg locks, and he teaches at a very uh, systematic and uh in fluid manner on things that are very complicated top-notch seminar and you know he comes directly from the source you know you talk about danaher he broke off and went with cunning every cummings when Eddie cummings left and yeah you know, well eddie was, cummings well eddie cummings ended up at unity and then he he was sort of doing his own thing for a minute right uh with like kaplan and those guys at in brooklyn uh it, it sucks that news travel like like the story of jujitsu is told so quickly that his time with the DDS, I feel like keeps it, it's getting further and further in the rear view. Right. But the guy won an EBI belt back when that was like, yeah, back when that was, was a yeah, real fucking deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> coming, coming, yeah, deal. Come, and you know, and there are those out there that would argue, and even John Danaher is quoted in saying such that Eddie Cummins was very pivotal in the creation of some of the systems that Danaher implemented into his leg lock game. And now everyone will challenge that, but coming from directly from the source, John Danaher himself has mentioned that, um, you know, Cummings is an incredibly intelligent person. He's got an engineering degree and decided to pursue a jujitsu career. Yeah. Uh, figure that one out, but maybe he's not so bright, <laughs> but 
you know, he's passionate about it. He did a good job. And, you know, John Collinstein left to go train with Eddie Cummings. And now Eddie, and, you know, John was right with Eddie Cummings the whole time and helped develop the game himself, the leg lock game himself. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping you got to talk to him. Does he like, where is he training these days? Um, he has his gym in Brooklyn. I think he said it was. Yeah. Um, like it's, is it the grapplers club or I, I, I remember he had some, oh, he was starting something over there, but I, I kind of lost I for, track. Of I it. forget what it was. It's a, it's a Henzo. I think it's a Henzo affiliate. I can't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it is a Henzo affiliate, but uh, yeah, COVID's COVID's knocking everybody down up there still it's hard to get things going up there with all this covid shit going on so I if was, you are in the, yeah. if you are in the new york area go hit up john collinstein's gym because he could use all the help he can get yeah we're always looking to help a homie out it broke my heart i was uh one of the last things i was doing for the jjt i covered the, the first emerald city invitational where he was supposed to have that super fight yeah and with all the crazy stuff that happened with the the event uh um health technician or like the doctor on the on-site physician that's right he had to leave, he had to leave like, early and so every, <laughs> half of the like the last few uh matches had to get like like the final of the tournament had to get like warp speeded through and john's match got completely cut just in its entirety that's crazy. which just it sucked like because i was so looking forward to seeing him compete we like, actually we yeah. had actually on uh, Saturday, there was a submission only tournament at the end of uh, the seminar, and uh, Keith Kerkarian was there. I was actually, you see the picture of me with yeah. John and Keith. I was actually, I was saying, I was gonna hang out. I thought, oh shit, maybe we'll get to see John Collins and Keith Kerkarian go at it. I mean, literally two guys, two of the best guys, little guys out there grappling right now. Yeah, whatever. yeah. They, they didn't, but John didn't Keith, compete, but whatever. Keith is Keith is teaching down there now, right? Yeah, he's with uh, Josh LaDuke now. He's training with Josh. I don't know how much he's teaching. I'm trying to get him to come out and teach a couple of nights a month at my gym just because I love the guy. I'd love to have him on that. It just makes me look cool. you know. Yeah, like the, <laughs> the whole situation that, you know, like the whole implosion of the of stuff with him up up here, up in Jersey uh, before he went down there. Maybe that'll be an episode like farther down the line, but it, it was it was kind of well, I got I got a line out there with Keith. We get him on sometime, and I, I think – I think we're going to have Colin sign on next week. I'm going to try to get him on to do like a ADCC trials preview. Breakdown for yeah. November. Yeah. <laughs> we, was gonna, we were going to do it today, but uh, Uncle Coach Kevin had a little rough weekend, so I kind of lost yeah, track. You said you, said, you, said you, were, you were up to some some mischief, Uncle Kevin. <laughs> Saturday night went down a spiral of depravity that I'm not too proud of. <laughs> I'm still kind of shaking the cobwebs out, finding my dopamine excess. Or dopamine uh, reserve somewhere laying around the house, hopefully. You know, you, you're gonna, you know, when your time comes, you're gonna go up. St. Peter's gonna be at the gates, and he's gonna be like, "Kev, we love you, but we we got to talk about October 23rd. We got to talk about, about uh, 2021, <laughs> October 23rd. The fuck, man." Yeah, but- it like, was bordering, bordering on questionable. Not gonna lie, he's <laughs> was just like we we got we got the list of infractions framed just because of how crazy it was. You were doing so well too, kid. <laughs> Flawless record, you know. He's looking for a place where his mom's cat can live, right. taking care of his mom. Doing Maybe we this. got this little blurp on the radar on the twenty third. <laughs> like we had to spend like sleepless nights like filing all this shit you we get, talked you get, about it and we we all agree that we, we at least have to bring it up to you like guys. we're gonna bring you in you're good but like fuck man, <laughs> man the reason I mean, why i continue to do good deeds is to make up for the the many occasions where i fall off the wagon and it's it's fuck so it all funny up. it's so funny because just before this episode started i was watching a uh, MMA on point video, you know, their top 10 lists that they yeah. do. Mm-hmm. There was this one that was just like the, the most recent one they put out was uh, 10 times uh, fighters in the old guard proved it wasn't over yet. And I feel like the new number one should be Kevin Gallagher, October 23rd. <laughs> 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 now, by all accounts, Uncle Kevin Gallagher's liver should have quit years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that actually that leads serendipitously, serendipitously right into one of the first things we wanted to talk about that, and that was the last emperor himself, Fedor Emelianenko, just put a forty-five knocking out Tim Johnson in the first of uh, first round of their three-round fight. 
Uh, yeah, it was Bellator 269. And I know this is something you wanted to talk about because in the lead up, um, D- Daniel Cormier, former two division champion of the UFC, made statements saying that had Fedor you know, spent more time in the UFC, he would have been a middling fighter. And I wanted to know if, A, what were your thoughts on that at the time? And B, have they changed at all with this most recent win? Wow. I mean, first of all, before we do anything else, let's just talk about how amazing <laughs> the fight would have been between Daniel Cormier and uh, Fedor Emelianenko when Fedor was in his prime. Like, it's just the, the implication there. I mean, there could you think of two guys that are maybe more more evenly matched than the two of them, which has been such an amazing fight to witness to be a part of? Um, like Strike Force DC versus Pride Fade. Right, right, right. Like, or, I mean, no, well, I would even say maybe even uh, DC, you know, later in his career when he really started learning how to strike and he really got his boxing in point because he is unquestionably a very underrated striker. You could make you could make the debate that he was beating Stipe on the feet for the majority of his two fights and just got clipped because Stipe was the bigger, stronger fighter. Same thing with John Jones, to, as a matter of fact. I think he um, was definitely – I think Stipe was definitely losing that fight. Yeah. Like, it, it, the body shots were undoubtedly, over the course of the fight, hurting him. But pure optics-wise, I'm like, he's getting he, – he scored takedowns. Yeah. Like, he was getting it in on the, the damage. It's – it was it – was, it was bad. He's just so big and massive that DC, like, eventually he got worn down and the bigger guy won that fight, which is what happens a lot of times. Same, we talked about it against, uh, you know, the Wilder Fury fight. The bigger guy wore the smaller guy down. It's just how it happens. That's why heavyweights are heavyweights. Um, but it's just a curious – it's such a curious topic of discussion when you consider Fedor's legacy. It's one of those unfortunate sets of circumstances where you can always debate how great he is, but it's very difficult because he never fought in the UFC. And as much as people would like to talk about pride, as much as people like to talk about strike force and some of the other areas, I mean, did he ever fight strike force? He didn't fight strike force. He did. Did he find a fat? Yeah, that he was, did. He that fought. was uh, right. Fabricio. That was, I, it's funny because I, for a little bit, misremembered that as a UFC fight. Because yeah, I thought like funny. that would make sense. But that no. was that heavyweight Grand Prix thing they were doing yeah. for more. And he lost his first loss was to Fabricio for Doom. And then Which, he you lost know, that you know Bigfoot. that makes sense. You know, like Fabricio's no joke. But at that, you could also make the argument that at that point he was partially on the decline of his greatness. Um, you know, his heyday was obviously in the Pride era. And you know, when you talk about all of those things considered, unfortunately, we can talk about pride, we can talk about all of those things. It's still no comparison to being the UFC heavyweight champion. And there's nothing anyone can say to me to change my mind about that. It's just what we consider to be just like we consider the linear champion in the heavyweight boxing division to be the, the universal champion. The UFC is generally considered to be the champion at heavy at the heavyweight division. If you haven't done it in the UFC, you really didn't do it yet. Yeah, but like, do you think that's always been the case? You know? Yeah. Like, so, but there's so many things that lead up to this discussion. It's the same thing when we start to talk about what really constitutes the GOAT, you know, the greatest of all time. Well, there's so many factors. Yeah. To factor in to, to what the greatest of all time considers. And one of the biggest things is, is what era were they fighting? And, you know, unfortunately, as eras progress, so does the quality of fighting. And we are looking now at the time when Fedor was in that division. You know, there were some great, great fighters, but the quality of MMA has advanced significantly from those days. So how do you say that someone like Fedor would level up and be able to hang uh, some of the tip, some of the uh some of the fighters that DC was mentioning particularly were Cain Velasquez, uh, some of the more skilled fighters in the UFC division. Like, how do you say, how can you even compare what Fader's skill set is to a Cain Velasquez at that point? Because they fought in different eras. It's like the whole idea of Mike Tyson versus Ali, who's the greatest. So, well, yeah. first of all, Ali is, you know, 30 fucking years older than Mike Tyson and they fought in different eras. So it's a different game. Yeah. So do you think that there's anything worth even the conversation? Just because I, I like people still, like it's weird because people like Chamberlain or or uh, 
or Michael Jordan and say like you put them anywhere anytime they could they would have been at least a, a, a like two time champion you know so like so Kev the point is is you can say that yeah anyone can say things but you can never truly duplicate it because Wilt Chamberlain is an old fucking man he's dead now you yeah. know what I mean like you can't. There's never a world where you'll be able to see World Chamberlain play in the modern day NBA. And we can speculate that he would be okay, but we really don't know that to be true because they can never really duplicate what it's really like. So yeah. it's fun to talk about. And I'm sure there's a bunch of old uh, old MMA nerds out there that would love to love to have that discussion with me and love to tell me about how I'm wrong and how uh, that you know Fado is the greatest and Sakuraba is the greatest and all these other things. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to prove that because there's no way to duplicate the environment. You can't have a controlled environment to have those variables interact in. Yeah. So I I, I do think it's fun. It's a fun, you're right. It is a fun conversation. Uh, But I do not, I'm not sure what is to be gained outside of just, you know, offering an opinion on something. I don't know what kind of things we could gain from really delving into it. Just because I I think if anything, it calls, it it, it encourages people to go look up Fedor's highlight reels just because it's, you know, there are people that don't really know much about pride. I I'm fairly, you know, lacking in knowledge about pride. You know, I I haven't, you know, gone, gone through the the fight tape and seen any of the old full through matches. I didn't see peak rampage. I didn't see, uh, I've seen Krokot. I've probably the most, the most, uh, content I've watched is like Krokop head kick highlight reels, which is just, (laughs) which is just a fun time. If you ever want to, if you want to see, so if you want to see a guy get hit and then fall down and be sure they're dead, be <laughs> yeah. like, oh, they're, that's dead. They're, this this guy, there's no possible way that guy is alive after that. You should go watch Krokop kicking people in the head back when yeah. he was just some nightmare. From Fedor's Croatia. highlight reel is impressive. I'm not going to lie. I've seen yeah. that over and over again. But again, is the quality of opponent he is facing at the same level of what we have? in the top tier of the UFC right now. And that was what Daniel Cormier was postulating. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't think there's too many, too many other people. I don't think that Daniel Cormier is, is a biased person from what I've known of him. And I don't think there's too many other people on the planet that have as much of a knowledge of the heavyweight division in the UFC as Daniel Cormier does. So for him to be able to say that he comes from a place of, uh, you know, of, of, of professionalism or a place of, of, of knowledge. Yeah, I it's it's interesting. And so, well, did you did you end up getting to see Fedor's fight too? I mean, no, it, I didn't. I the fucking whole thing was on YouTube, so you you could like it's it's clipped. It was so fast that it's just like getting shared. I, I you know I saw I saw it was like a fifteen second knockout or something like that. It was in the first round. It was like yeah, yeah. it was super something early. Like that, something like that. I should have watched it. I should have watched the Costa fight, which we're gonna talk about too. But you know, you'd think I was a. MMA journalist or something would put time into watch <laughs> this weekend was a wash. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just by the way, I'm just, I'm just day. happy that I'm just happy that, uh, this conversation hasn't led to people saying crazy shit. Like, Oh, like, why didn't we ever get to see Randy Couture versus Colby Covington or some yeah, right. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> and that's always the discussion. Like I have so many people that tell me like, you know, fucking, Mike Tyson was the greatest ever in all time or fucking, you know, Muhammad Ali would beat Mike Tyson or, or any of these situations. And it's, it's, I always look at them and I say, well, you know, we can discuss this and we can debate this, but it really doesn't make any difference because who really fucking knows who would beat who, because they're never going to be able to fight because you could definitely make the dis- debate that a prime Muhammad Ali could outmaneuver and move fucking Mike Tyson around and tire him out enough, just like he did to everybody else. He was, he was amazing in his prime and say, you know, but you never can tell because they're never going to be able to fight. Yep. And I, I, my opinion would be if you look at how effective Fedor was just from the, the number standpoint, who he was knocking out, the fact that he's a 45 year old man that can still knock someone out. Yeah. After all the damage he's taken and the guy's a, a well-rounded individual. He was a fucking Sambo champion before he started. I, I think you take that guy and you give him all the advantages of of better medical technology about conditioning, 
surgeries, uh, nutrition, and the way the game is played, you know, like I, I think that that's a guy that can, that can, I, I, I don't think he would be just some middling fighter in the UFC. No, that's what no. I'll say to that. And DC, that was, I, don't, I don't think that wasn't fair. <laughs> no, DC said top five. He said he would, he said he could make it to the top 10, top five. I don't think he would be someone that would just be a passer. Have player. I been misremembering this whole, I thought he would be like a middling. I thought he said he'd be middling. I could be completely wrong. I thought he said top five ish. Is Hang what I on. Thought he said top five ish talent is what I thought DC said, but. I mean, I could be wrong on that too. Maybe DC thinks he sucks. I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, DC, he definitely beat some of the fucking, I mean, he beat Randall freaking uh, John Randleman. He beat some of the best guys out there. Um, Hang on. Okay. So DC Fedor. Yeah. He said he would have been, okay. So the idea is he would have been average at best. That was average. Okay. Just average yeah. at best. So that, I think that is where I, I wasn't some lazy shit journalist. <laughs> I yeah, maybe, right maybe he did. Maybe he. That did. is a bit. But hey, yeah. listen, a guy like Stipe at this point, his concern is you know building his legacy, becoming this armchair talking head guy, which is the move. It's the move for him because of his career, and he's earned the right to do that. He's he's kind of just turning into Shaq or Charles Barkley, where he's kind of like he he's going to be calling. He's calling. He's going to be calling out the young bucks, and he's going to be calling out the guys that came before him. You yeah. know, like. he's a former heavyweight UFC heavyweight champion. He's allowed to do whatever the hell he wants to do, and people have to listen. To he him. was, a, and he's a champ, champ too. Two division, two division, yeah, and uh, it's very appropriate because we cannot. One cannot mention Daniel Cormier without soon talking about oh, the latest boy. John Jones news <laughs> in, the, in going on and everything. <laughs> And Got this is a bit this is a bit old, but it happened while the podcast like the podcast had come out, and then it was uh, it was announced that John Jones, everyone's favorite well-adjusted sober individual, uh, has been removed from uh, his fight camp. Uh, Jackson Wink has thrown him the has tossed him out and said he is to be banned until he can get some aspects of his life together. And so that's that is uh that's about as serious as things with him have gotten. So I, I don't know. What do you think? Does this change anything? Um, well, as much as I'd like to think it would, it doesn't seem to be. Um, it based upon John Jones's reply to that, a reaction to that, it didn't seem like it had the desired effect. It seemed like he's just going full steam ahead continuing with his life as general like he has no problems he has it all taken care of everything is fine which he does not let's yeah. be clear about that 100 does not have his life in order it should be glaringly obvious to everyone that he doesn't um uh you know i surprised it took this long uh winkle john said you know he thinks of john jones as his little brother and I can see how he would stick with him through everything. But, you know, when you listen to John's reply, he made it kind of sound like people turned their back on him in his most time of most need, and which is not true. They just said, look, asshole, we're not going to allow, allow you to continue training for a fight until you figure out what is wrong with you to get your life in order, man. You are beating your wife and scaring, you and your, and scaring her small child in the hotel rooms in Las Vegas. Like, you can't get away with that. That's not real. That's not what people do. That's not how people live their lives. You know, you need to get your life together and figure it out. And unfortunately, we have to make drastic decisions. Don't think that this decision isn't costing Winkle John a shit ton of freaking money. You know what I mean? This is a tough call on him, too. He had to cut away his golden goose. Um, but it has to happen. I'm still waiting to find out what happens with the legalities of this. If John Jones ends up in jail or if whatever happens I, I hope he does because i hope it's enough to clear his life up but it's just sad it's just such a sad imagine sad getting to the point where you're just like i hope this guy gets arrested for his own good yeah and that's really kevin 100 percent. he needs to realize that dude like i love you brother you're a good kid man not really but whatever like i will i hope there is a there could be a possibility where you could be a good kid and trust me the world loves a comeback story but you are not there yet, and you need to recognize that there are more. There are things that are more important in life than being a UFC champion, 
and you need to work on those things to get your life together in an order and then come back when you're ready for that. And you are just not ready for that based upon everything that is happening right now. You still do not believe that you have a problem. You're blaming the CTE. You're blaming the UFC. You're blaming everyone else for the fact that the problem is you. And until you recognize that, nothing else will happen to make your life better. This is totally off the beaten path, but it's something that I, I saw a post about it the other day and I thought it was just the funniest memory. Remember when John Jones was in some department clothing store and he saw that like there was a sign for black pants and in Spanish, in Spanish it said like Negro pants because Negro is black in Spanish. And he right. went on Instagram and he was like, we got to cancel this place. They're racist. Right. <laughs> I, I He was know. probably being it sarcastic is, about that, but who knows, man. I don't know. The video seemed like he was genuinely like yeah, mad. About, I don't know. <laughs> he is uh, – Man, I just every time I think about John Jones, it's just a sad, sad. It is well. Listen, it he it is the biggest missed opportunity. It is the biggest waste of talent. One of the biggest in the history of athletics, just in the history of sport. No guy has been better at his job, and equally good at like fucking up his job than John Jones. You know, Dennis Rodman. Was had a better just track record of keeping his shit together. Yeah, yeah. Mike Tyson. You know, Mike all Tyson. Of these guys, yeah, all of these guys have figured out ways to pull it back together again. And John Jones, man, you had plenty of opportunities to do it, and you never did, man. And it's just, it's just so obviously apparent that you never figured out a way to do the right thing. And it's just, it's one of those things where it's, man, I, I have a lot of drug abuse in my life kev i have a lot of friends of mine a lot of family members that have issues with drug abuse and across the board the one thing that is the most 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 disappointing is when you just know in your mind that they are just telling you whatever they feel like they want you to hear they're hustling you into believe no no no, no, Kevin. I got, I got everything together, man. I'm doing great, man. I'm doing fine. You're just looking at them. Yeah, man. I'm getting. I'm looking for yeah. a job. I'm like, yeah, and it's... you could just when there's no true remorse, when there's no feeling of sorrow. When you, what is it? The, the seven step program, the twelve step program. One of those steps. I don't know which one it is. Is remorse and apology, and making sure that you let people know that you let them down. And when you don't see that, you just know for a fact, man. You're just not you're not ready yet. You're not well yet. You're just lying to me. You're just play getting me. Until that point comes, I can't have anything to do with you. And that's just what I see when I see John Jones. Do you think we get to, there's a point we could get to where <laughs> at this point, do you think he has enough career left to not get in trouble and put on enough fights and and fulfill promises to for people to go, hey, it wasn't that bad? <sighs> God, it's just, I don't know, man. I because like dream scenario, dream scenario. He makes it to heavyweight, has a good fight at heavy. Does he fight is scheduled to fight someone? I don't I, even remember. Who knows what the, who knows what's going on now? I don't know anything scheduled, but you know if John Jones, if, if Dana White, if he doesn't get arrested, he just stays out of jail, you know Dana White will jump right on that to put him on the card against fucking- he, Dana White literally said anytime he, you, you were telling me, like anytime yeah. he, he's in Las Vegas, I have a clock that just like yeah. Yeah, timer just- that goes off. <laughs> But yet he still puts him on cards. I guess he does the same thing with Nick Diaz and Nate Diaz and the list goes on I love on. that. No, but here's the thing. Francis Ngannou, dream, like, like pristine, like squeaky clean champion, has never done anything wrong or gotten in trouble with the law. It kicks him to the curb. Yeah. Had, he literally is like, he put on a great performance against Stipe, the most successful UFC heavyweight we've ever seen, and says, I need some more time to rehab. Dana's like, tight, you're stripped. We're going to have an interim belt. Fuck you, Frank. It's insane. <laughs> John Jones, hey, hey, boss man. I uh, I hit my wife in front of my stepkid. <laughs> right. Yeah, while, while I was drunk and probably him. high on cocaine. Yeah, right. this was after I got a uh, DUI again. And then uh, again after that, Dana's like, well, John, you got to, you yeah. just got to kind of get it together, buddy. Do you will you be ready? Up, like, will you be ready next up, month? <laughs> do you want to end up like Francis, the guy in this new shit? Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a sad state of affairs, man. Like I, I, 
it sucks because I want to like John Jones, man. I want to respect him for the he's great a, fighter that he is because well, he's listen, an amazing we, fighter. We love our dog. We love we love people bringing it back because every one of us fucks up all the time. Yeah, you know. And so the idea of someone fucking up that much and then coming back and still being a successful athlete, we fetishize that stuff. We love it. We make movies about it. You you know that at one point. Someone went, John Jones getting in trouble. Like the first time John got in trouble, studio execs in Hollywood were like, oh, this is awesome. We got the movie. Right. Like we're going to, we're going to get someone ghostwriting a script or some bullshit. It's going to be great. And, and then he kept getting in trouble. And now they're like, can we even fucking release the movie now? At this point, yeah. it's an eight right. part, it's a 22 right. part documentary series. And by the right. end, are you even going to be on his side? Like, ever evolving, ever, exactly, ever evolving. We just spent the whole, we just finished fucking editing, dude. You fucked up again. Jesus it's Christ. It's like every it Friday, every, day. like every Friday the 13th is the same fucking movie where it's like Jason's on some shit and we got to get away from Jason. It's going to be, every John Jones movie is going to be, John's fucked up. He's got to <laughs> he's got to yeah. get through his jail time. <laughs> Kevin, the, the the reality of it is is until we start covering stories about John Jones in recovery instead of John Jones preparing for his next fight, this is going to continue to happen. And that's just the way it's going to be. He's never going to get better until he focuses on getting better instead of trying to become a heavyweight fighter. And I get it. I get it. You he's trying to capitalize on all that money he could be made, but every time he fucking Every time he fucks up, he shoots himself in the foot anyway, and he's gonna lose that. That dollar sign goes lower. And yeah, lower. I think that's that's basically all we can really say about John. You know, it's funny every time, every time we end up talking about him, I notice that we we always try and reach out to him, like just to say, "Hey, man, we hope you're doing well. We hope you get help." That's um, it, man. That's all you yeah, can do, kid. Yeah, but I would like to add that yeah, anyone anyone in John's life right now, uh, you're probably feeling it too. Uh, if you haven't already, you know, just the, the, the constant stuff going on. So we're sorry for you. And we hope everyone that's kind of affected by his, his uh, stuff, you know, is, is doing okay. And they get help too. Cause you know, not, you don't, you don't exist in a vacuum. No one exists in a vacuum. And so when stuff like this happens, you're bringing people along for the ride for better or worse, you know, and, so, you know, and anyone out there that is suffering with, with mental, mental, uh, Mental yeah, uh, issues and uh, the, problems. Uh, the, uh, one, I, I will research and put an appropriate helpline right below, so you can uh, go take a look at that because it's important stuff. Yeah, your your life will get better. Trust me, it's coming from someone that has been up and down on this roller coaster ride many, many times. Like, if you focus on yourself and you do the right things and you come humbly to the uh, to the understanding and realization that you need help you will get better. You will find a way to live and get through these things. Nothing is too far gone to change that. So please get help guys. Please get help. And I think that's a, that's a really somber note. And we got to transition from that <laughs> to talking about fat pieces of shit that don't want to make way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Segue that, <laughs> way, to, way to bring it back. And a guy who also needs help, but in putting down the fucking cheeseburgers, <laughs> Paulo Costa and Marvin Vittori had their uh, their UFC bout this past weekend. Absolute barn burner. Uh, Vittori eked out a very well deserved decision. But you know, both guys. I need to. This is the only time I'll be able to credit both men. Uh, absolutely put on a show. It was a phenomenal fight. Go back and watch it. But we're not going to talk about that because it's almost a non sequitur. Because I will. I will say that when. Uh, Israel Adesanya saw the fight. He was uh, he was watching it on his phone. He's like, "Oh shit, Vittori looks good. Still a little bitch though." <laughs> I saw I saw a meme like that. I saw, yeah. I saw him in bed with his phone. It's a very yeah. impressed or some shit like Just that. Just like fuck this guy. Right. Yeah, I um. So yeah, the big news of the fight was uh, a week before Paulo Costa announced that he was currently two hundred. He was north of two hundred pounds fight was supposed to be at 185 212 i think he said he weighed it two, like jesus that. christ 212 and uh obviously if you even if he could successfully cut that weight he might die right uh and so he basically just said yeah i'm not going to be able to make the weight which fair on him is a that's at least he was open about it <laughs> Johnny Hendricks would just take to the scale. Yeah, at least at least he was at least he was cool enough to make the announcement a week prior instead of just showing up. Yeah. 
and Eight that pounds gave over ten pounds and over. Uh, Marvin Vittori in what was a very cool move because he could have easily and justifiably been like, "Wow, go fuck yourself." Uh, said, "I'll take the fight at two o five. Can you make two o five? And Paul's like, "Yeah." And uh, that's how the fight got the car. The, the fight got saved. The main event got saved. Ended up being great. But once again, a lot of people. First of all, the even if Paulo Costa had won, does this do, would that fight have put him anywhere closer to fighting uh, Adesanya again? You know, it's funny you talk about that because I was uh, I was watching sparring last night with Billy Q. He was sparring with a long cruise. You know, both UFC vets. Yeah, and. Uh, I was having a small conversation with him at the same time because right when they were sparring was about two days after uh, Costa made the uh, announcement of not being able to make weight or whatever. It was the same week. Um, And they were talking about that same exact thing. And, um, you know, it sucks because Sean Selby hates that shit because now this fight means nothing. Now there's no, yeah. there's no up in the ranks. There's because you didn't fight at the division you're supposed to fight at. So this is something they do. Yeah, they saved the main event. You know they were allowed to continue to fight because Vitali decided. Is that his name? I can't if I said it right or not. You know, I probably did. Vittori. Vittori yeah. decided to take the fight at 205, which he didn't have to. You know, but he still wants to get paid. So I was just gonna fucking take it. And fucking, you don't have to, but you know, you also don't have to get paid either. So well, what the fuck are you gonna do? Of course, I'm gonna take the fucking fight. But it's just unfair and it sucks and it's a shitty thing. And, you know, there's so many different things we could say about this. Yeah, weight cutting is stupid. You know, we could talk about Joe Rogan every time he talks about weight cutting. He hates it. And I hate it myself personally. I think it's a ridiculous practice. It shouldn't be involved. I think it's something that's been grandfathered in and decided to be the norm since the early days of boxing. And it's a ridiculous practice that doesn't make any sense if guys are just like, okay, fuck it. Let's just fight where we're at. Everything will be fucking fine. But no, because people want to get that unfair advantage. They cut weight and yada, yada, yada. And here we and are. And if one person's cutting weight, everyone's going to cut Everyone's going to do it. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, when you talk about it in the big picture of things, um, guys are always going to do this too. They're always going to look to get that competitive edge. And if cutting weight down to X, Y, Z in order to make the weight, in order to be the smaller guy, because in theory, now when you cut that weight down, you are a bigger person that loses water weight. So you rehydrate. And now you are still a bigger person. That's the theory of it. Um, they're still going to do it. And the reason why they have weigh ins the day before is because now you have plenty of time to rehydrate and get your body right again. So you're not completely depleted and your brain's not fucking dehydrated. So you don't get, you know, brain injuries. And um, so the better way to do it is to have them cut the weight the day before, weigh in the day before so that they're not weighing in right before the match. Because it doesn't matter when you have the weigh-ins, kid. Guys are always going to cut weight to make that weight. It doesn't yeah. fucking matter. They're going to do it. Yeah. It's just it's a shitty situation all around. Because yeah. now you have guys like Costa, like Johnny Hendricks, like uh, who else is the one who just fought? I forget his name. Kevin Cal- uh, Calvin Gasolin. Kev- Kelvin Gaslin. <laughs> These guys Although, that to struggle. be fair, to be fair, like that Kelvin, he he's he doesn't look he he's doesn't a, he doesn't look like he cuts any weight. He needs to cut. He is the one person you gotta cut go. More, you gotta cut right. weight. You should cut more, but but I mean, you it leads to the situation where these guys, you know, they they can't really make the weight anymore. You know, Connor probably couldn't make featherweight anymore if he really wanted to. Fucking Khabib was having a hell of a time getting down to lightweight. You know, these guys, they cut all this weight and they kill themselves. It's almost harder than the damn fight. No, for real. I felt more the last the only time I really seriously cut weight was over a year ago for uh, a tournament here in Jersey, right before the pandemic happened. And I felt more victory just getting on the scale and it reading 149 than I felt, you know, taking third. Like it, it was just like, holy shit, the I, I successfully did the thing. I've been working at for months and the dieting, everything I did. I hated it. It didn't feel good at all. I have, I've talked about this on uh, stuff we've done before, but my, my dad out of him and his brothers, he is the only one, not six foot. And he's the only one who wrestled and cut a lot of weight during high school and a little bit of college. So and he's still, girl. to this day, he's like, if I hadn't fucked my hormones up, I'd be seven feet tall. <laughs> he's like, I know it. I just know it. Like, <laughs> You know, it's, 
It's unfortunate, Kev, because yeah. just like you said, those things, what you start to find now are guys that like learning to cut weight and learning to make the weight becomes a skill set that you develop on your own. You know, it's something that is an extra added element to the fighting situation that becomes something you have to stress on instead of focusing on actually getting better at your art, whether it's jujitsu or MMA and focusing on the many things you have to do to get ready for your competition. You expend extra time on cutting weight. I always tell my guys uh, for jujitsu competitions, I'm like, dude, don't cut. What are you fucking cutting weight for? It's fucking stupid. Like if you can't get it off naturally on the long haul and it's not stressing your brain out to the fucking X amount, like don't even worry about that shit. And it's ridiculous. Focus on bidding better at jujitsu. Focus on learning how to win in the division you're at. And pay more attention to getting at your jujitsu because if you're sucking your life out, your training sessions are going to be worse. You're not going to be able to get the optimal amount of performance out of yourself. And on top of that, in an MMA jujitsu match, you're weighing in the day of, so you don't even have that extra time to recover. Yeah, you're going to chug Pedialyte like 20 minutes before your match. Like, yeah. how how much good can you do, right. really? Like, you're, yeah. you're still going to be very depleted. It's just a ridiculous practice that shouldn't be happening anymore and like classic example is a guy like paula costa ridiculously unprofessional you're a professional fighter kid you're supposed to make weight um i guarantee you sean selby and and dana white told him the same thing like you were well you were 10 pounds over 15 pounds over where you're supposed to be they did uh there was an announcement dana white said uh one marvin his stock shot up in their eyes. So they're going to be a lot uh, of course. easier to work with. Like he's like, he saved like this. He saved this card. And so, he won. And he, which is the, like the dream scenario that everyone. Right. It was a win win for him. I think also even if he, he had, lost. Also, he also, he got 30% of, uh, he got 30% of cost. Good. First too, good. So he's just getting paid. Yeah, good. Fuck <laughs> I don't him. think he, he got, I don't think he got fight. I don't know if he got fight of the night, but it was definitely a conversation. That was a, it was a hell of a fight. I'm sure he um, was well taken care of. And he should have been. Yeah. And also, uh, Dana also said that Paulo Costa will now have to fight at light heavyweight. Like, like it's obvious that this is where his, his more natural weight lies. And obviously Dana White said shit that hasn't amounted to anything. Like he said that, um, Amanda Nunes would never main event a card again. So, right. That that what was, didn't. What happen. was his problem with Amanda Nunez? What did he? What did she Amanda she Nunez she do? like something happened. Like she got sick the day of the card or the day before oh, yeah, right. the card, and he's like, it's so unprofessional, and like, yeah, no, so, but you know, bullshit. So who knows what kind of right? Um, do you think he should fight at light heavyweight though? I mean. We'll see. I mean, he fought an inflated, uh, an inflated middleweight at this two hundred five weight division. I don't think that he's big enough to fight at two hundred five. Maybe he is. I don't know. He's a really big middleweight. He's got but I don't short know. arms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he's not that. He's not that big of a person. You know, yeah, heavyweights are all six three, six four, six five. They're all monsters, you know. And I don't think call it pos- I don't think that he his his skill set and his body type fits well in that light heavyweight division but you know he's still awesome he's still an amazing fighter we'll let him fight a couple light heavyweight fights and you never know maybe, Outside of, maybe i could be transition i could be co- totally just not paying enough attention but outside of his like incredible performance against uh yoel romero what are the big fights that he's known for you know I, I mean, he was 14. What was he? He, he had an undefeated streak for a while. Yeah, I'm just out. saying I mean, he was like murking everybody. So that's oh, yeah, enough he was, to turn heads. But yeah, I think it's I think it's the this and then like right off after the Israel that, fight that has people kind of going. Like, yeah, the Israel yeah. fight sucked. Yeah, Very, was this was bad. supposed to be his opportunity to come back and show the fight was great. He, was. he sucked. Yeah, like, he sucked. <laughs> yeah, but this was supposed to be his I'm back ready to go. And you don't even make weight, brother. Like, how the fuck are we supposed to take you seriously now? You know, that's yeah. just my opinion on it. It's just so many. This the other making weight is being a professional. Yeah, making weight is saying this is what I signed the contract at. I know I can do this, and I'm telling you, somewhere along the, the line, there wasn't unforeseen circumstances that that led to his inability to make weight. Yeah, his inability to make weight 
was 100% contingent upon him doing something wrong and getting out of whack before he had an opportunity to correct that. Um, you know, when you're cutting that much weight for a fight, yeah. it's not just about the the last minute cut yeah. because you can't get there. You have to follow your diet strictly throughout the course of your camp or whatever you need to do to maintain that weight loss to cut that weight down. And somewhere along the line, he didn't. Maybe he had one too many barbecues back in the freaking San Paulo or whatever it was. And he yeah. put on an extra weight. Well, uh, and, and he's a very, like, in weigh-ins all the time, he's a very – like angry and loud type of guy. He has a lot of trash talk and I've always wondered why, like why he's so angry. Cause I look at him, I'm like, you are a jacked good looking dude. What could make you so angry? And it's funny because uh, during the fight we got, I got a little bit of a hint. I think I figured out why Paulo Costa is so angry. It <laughs> might have something to do with this. Now, maybe I'm just super observant. And uh, the normal person <laughs> wouldn't notice, but if you look at his hair situation, <laughs> <laughs> and listen, man, I'm getting there. No, but for real, I'm, I'm like myself. Hey, look, look, I'm I got that shit going on too. So Paula, listen, I yeah, we I, Paula, get it. I we get, get it. it. We get so it. I get some, your some suffering. creams for that though. You put a salve on there, maybe it grows out. He actually little. posted a little while ago. He got hair transplant surgery, <laughs> so it's, it hasn't grown in yet though. So. <laughs> Uh, whatever long story <laughs> short weight oh, cutting man. is a problem i don't think we're ever going to fix it's never going anywhere i'd like there's we they've tried a thousand different ways to come up with a solution to it. it's not going to happen guys are well, one one way. fc i know people like to clown on them just because it's probably a ponzi scheme of an organization but one <laughs> fc one fc does make a big to do about their hydration tests and how they, they try to monitor fighters at different stages of camp. And, and that, that makes people have to compete at their more natural weight. Do you think that the UFC would ever be, ever be able to implement something like that? Or are they fine with just like USADA? Who knows, man? Like, I, I mean, do you think that Dana White's, I mean, what Dana White's a very, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of guy, I think. And like, shit, he isn't he paying the guys more. So why the hell would he worry about changing the weigh-in fucking thing? This is your job. You signed a contract to weigh in this weight. You make weight or you don't fight. And if you don't fight, we'll find somebody else. That's always the Dana White template for success. You don't like what you're, what you're getting paid? Fine, go fight somewhere else because we'll find somebody else to take the money because they'll want it. That seems to always be... Dana White's mantra. He's not concerned about changing the machine. He's concerned about making the machine function at a higher level. I think that that's what he sees his job as primarily. Yep. Just like my job is. You know, and <laughs> right. I think that any changes will have to happen with the next guy. Yeah. I mean, and whatever, we'll see who the next guy is going to be. We might get better. Hey, hey, look, one thing I, I just want better gloves. That's probably the number one thing I want is uh, gloves that don't, don't like let your fingers stick out so people aren't getting eye poked all the time. They talked about the the pride gloves is a little bit better. Yeah, the curled better. ones. The curled ones a little bit more better. Ah, who knows, man? That, there's not really an answer to that either. Eye pokes are, are part of what happens when you're fighting with your damn hands. You got to have your fingers and shit like that. So what do you really do? You put like fucking thimbles on the end of your finger so they can't get poked in the everyone get fight glo fight goggles fight goggles <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like the the oh my god uh horse grant <laughs> horse grant with the bulls <laughs> he's got the goggles <laughs> bill lambeer when he wore the mask I mean, yeah that? <laughs> that's even better <laughs> oh man yeah okay well I think that's about it for all the big news items uh, yeah. we wanted to cover. And I know we're going to be talking more about uh, the trials next week, hopefully with John Calistein. Try to get oh. Calistein on. We were going to get him on this week, but we kind of fell behind. I think we're going to get him on here next week to talk about Awesome. It. But uh, in case we don't get around to it, um, any any uh, any tips for aspiring trial winners out there? Uh, yeah, man, someone will, with an in-depth knowledge of the ADCC rule set. I will tell you this, man. I have had a considerable amount of uh, success in the ADCC trials. I'm actually kind of upset I'm not up there this year. I really wanted to go, but he's got so much shit going on. We'll get into it more in depth next week with John Kallenstein. Uh, but 
it's very important to understand the rules of the ADCC. And that's what Mo Jassett has been saying all freaking for the last three months, four months. Know the rules of the ADCC in order to succeed in the ADCC. It's super, super important. It's very difficult to score in the ADCC, and you use that to your advantage whenever possible. You, know, you have three minutes of submission only, then you only have three minutes of points, which is a very, very short time to score. Um, utilize turtle guard as much as you possibly can. Uh, getting up to your knees is an awesome way to avoid getting scored on off of a takedown and or off of a, a guard pass. Um, and when you get taken down, you have to be have your shoulders on the mat for a three second count or your butt on the mat for a three second count in order for the takedown to count. Um, so use that. And it is a long three count. That's a long one, two, three. Same thing with a guard pass. Um, and I will tell you the guys that understand that and utilize that to the best of their abilities are the guys that win. Learn how to wrestle, learn how to take the back. When guys try to go to turtle, that's when you see the most scores. Most scores from the ADCC are from takedowns and guys coming back up to their knees to get their hooks in. That's what you see the most in the ADCC. Um, learn how to capitalize on that, and you should do well. You know, leg locks, leg locks, leg locks. Everybody's fucking running the leg locks. But right now, even leg locks not working that great. But that's my two bits. Know the rules. Learn how to play by the rules, and those are the guys that succeed in the ADCC. All right. Now, here are my tips to win at the ADCC. <laughs> Kev, what do you got? <laughs> All right. First of all, everything Kev says bullshit. Uh, you're going to want to uh, just fly in triangle. Spam flying triangle. Uh, and if that doesn't work, you obviously got your pocket sand that you can throw. Uh, <laughs> the, great, the great kabuki style. Like yeah, ex- exactly. Uh, and then you can tag in muscle man Randy Savage. He can finish the job for you. And then you're on to the next man. <laughs> Kev, I got a question for you before we go. Sure. <laughs> Did you uh did you watch Dune yet? Have you seen the new Dune? I have. I'm seeing it. I'm going to see my best friend uh, next week, and we're going to go see it together. Have you seen uh, it? I did. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. I I I again was a little bit lost. I kind of got confused. I don't really know what the fuck is going on. It just, can it, I, I I'm gonna lie. I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you that I've never seen the John Lynch version. I've never read the books, and it's a very yeah nerdy of me i should probably watch that just because hey look if it helps i've had it sitting on my shelf for like two years and i haven't <laughs> touched it I, I literally got the book when i heard they were making this movie and i'm like oh i'll, I'll read it in time for the movie <laughs> has my, not moved from its spot <laughs> my opinion is the end of the the end of the movie is like okay what's next <laughs> like literally at the end of the movie you're like oh, oh just you, like you literally you think you have like another hour of the movie to go and it just ends and it's just a weird spot to end. and i never saw the david lynch version so that's probably where it ends there too but i don't know well it seems like I've there heard, should be more to I it i think from what i've heard they're planning on making sequels like I'm it's sure. a series of it seems it's a series like of it. books yeah so is it um, so okay so there's more to it than just that i thought i didn't know if that was the the entirety of the yeah the book series i mean we got we got to go support that. we got to go support um uh dune just because uh local white belt jason momoa is in it you know he's this, <laughs> he's this well-to-do actor he's mainly known as a jujitsu player that's right uh, but he's right he's there. a big he, movie star he, he did that aquaman thing something about yeah the, that was like the king of the Dolph rocky it was indie film, and he did like a small bit part on a, a little, TV show. A little, a little something on a TV show, but the jujitsu is where it's at. Dave I kind of the same thing. Purple it's funny. Belt. It's funny because like with celebrities, often you'll you'll get like one picture of them in the gi, and then they're like zip about it <laughs> afterwards. And I, he, I hope, I want him to just do more stuff like with jujitsu because like guys like him could just take it to a million more people. You know, like they could like I wonder if it, I Henry wonder if Cavill a piece to... Henry Cavill like posts pictures after like training at Hodgers all the time. And that's I wonder cool. if Batista had a little session on the set. That'd be so awesome if they did. Batista's oh yeah, a, he's a Batista's a brown belt. Purple belt. He might purple be a brown belt. belt by now. I know he's been a purple belt forever, but I don't know how hard he's been training. I did a couple sessions with 
Dave Batista, if you're out there listening for some reason or another. <laughs> I, I would Dave love Batista. to have you come train sometime. I don't even care. I love you. You're just awesome. I'd love to have you on the mats to train. He lives in Tampa. He's right around the corner. He was uh, – was he a wrestling I, – I, I know he was a, obviously WWE, but did he, like, do any wrestling before that? I, You know, I have spoken to him before, and I've seen him on a podcast, and I can't remember it exactly, but I don't think he did. I don't think he really got into wrestling until he did professional wrestling. as a, he, he started – getting bigger he's always kind of a smaller like gangly kid and one thing led to another and he bulked up and started doing professional wrestling i think what happened and that segued him to where he is now but he's good dude he really is good he's a good oh, yeah? actor he really how's is a good his, actor how's his game by the way like i've just... never rolled with him uh, okay but he's a oh. massive human being i did some boxing private lessons with him for a while he trains with another guy out here so was it before or after like guardians of the galaxy like before like it was when he was after the- no after Guardians of the Galaxy, after oh. the first Avengers movie, this was probably about two and a half years ago, three years ago, maybe. So it's remember. so everybody, you've heard it here first. When you make it big, your first call needs to be Kevin Gallagher. Of course, one hundred percent. but whatever. only after you've done a Marvel movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're not in, if you're not an A-lister, I mean, like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll find a slot for you, maybe. Yeah, he's got Daniel Craig and Idris Elba next week. <laughs> 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 the list goes on if you on. if you ever want to see like a really interesting reality show, um, you know Idris Elba, right? Yeah, yeah. He did a show where he trained for like six months to have a like a pro Muay Thai fight. I heard it was really good too, and yeah. I thought it would be a weird show, but I, I was watching. I'm like, oh shit, this guy's like one. He's jacked. He's a beautiful yeah. human being, and two, he went to Thailand. He went all over. He was like training during like movie sets and like they just follows him the whole time and the guy he fought wasn't a can like he was coming off of a that's, that's what rogan said rogan said he looked really good like rogan said he fought it like he wasn't it wasn't a work like this no. was a real fight this was a yeah. real fight yeah. like i it's one of those shows i saw and then i i i told everyone i knew about it because i'm like it's so crazy that he did this and that his agents let him do this he could have broken Right. His limbs. He could have like right. gotten permanently fucked up in his face, and like yeah. he's just out there doing it. Like, you gotta, gotta, yeah. give him, gotta give him props for that. Elders, yeah. don't give him a fuck. He's a good yeah. guy. I yeah. like that guy. Like, he's one of my favorite. Oh actors. no, dude, he's he's fucking awesome. And also, just uh, just because we're this is the sort of part of the show we're talking about cool stuff we've seen. Um, Jonah Hill, the the guy from uh, yeah Wolf of Wall Street and yeah. uh, Super Bad. You know yeah. that. Uh, he he made waves a while ago because he started doing jujitsu, right? And uh, homie's been sticking with it. He's posting like takedown videos. Good he for him, man. He slimmed down a little yeah. bit, you know. Uh, he seems really cool, but the, I'm pissed at him because he had a he did this show on YouTube called uh, Essentials, and it's where a, a famous person takes you through their most important like daily possessions, like the soda they like, their 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 music or like their favorite like fucking thermos or shit or some shit like like sunglasses like uh rem- i don't know but at the end of the episode he's like i got one more essential and he pulls out one of those super limited edition peach colored show yo roll uh geese that are like two thousand dollars and i'm like oh you son of a bitch oh you <laughs> son of a bitch <laughs> i want that so fucking bad <laughs> yeah good for him i tell you all these everybody wants to talk shit about all these celebrities posting pictures about their jujitsu and this and that and i'm like dude fuck you every one of you assholes is doing the same exact fucking thing you're always posting your fucking dumbass pictures on fucking instagram (laughs) no one gives a shit so don't act like you're not the same fucking blue belt that talks about jujitsu changing your goddamn life or the white belt with two stripes that talks about how much you love jujitsu these guys just happen to be movie stars that have millions of followers. So we can talk shit about them because they seem to be the wrong people or they seem to be like they're in the bag. So anyway. I didn't want it. I didn't want it to seem like I was hating him. I just hate that he owns that. And I yeah. don't yeah. like, I'm jealous. Jo- Jonah, yeah. if you're listening to this, I'm so you're jealous. Like, jealous. We, Jonah, come train with me. I love you're it. in some of my favorite movies, man. Like we'd we'll, love to have you on. <laughs> we'll get you, we'll get you on the maps with uh, Batista and El Elba. Oh my God. Now <laughs> we, we got to have just like a celebrity, Henry, Henry celebrity, Dallas celebrity bjj bracket with um fuck who's the sean patrick flannery he's yeah. gonna be like the front runner and um oh my god the direct he's a great director um british he did yeah, like well, Rock, 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 guy, Rock. guy richie guy richie yeah like we gotta we gotta bring all the famous people that do jujitsu and just have them like 
duke it out. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's that's about it for me, man. You got anything? Nah, we're good. I love you. I got calls and fucking All right. drive to Trinity and go teach kids and all business kind of mogul. By the way, there. Kev, you gotta you gotta look happier if you're gonna take a video with yourself in the kids' class. You teach an hour with the kids and keep that smile on your face, brother. Good luck with that. I know it's just you you can see the disengaged, just like, and I'm fucking done. <laughs> <laughs> it's it'll if you don't mind, it'll be playing right like right here. <laughs> All right, kiddo, I gotta bounce too. So all right. So once again, shout out to our friends, No Judges Needed and Off Colony, the the yin and yang of different styles of BJJ apparel. Go check either of them out if you're looking to upgrade your wardrobe this holiday season. And again, thanks to Chris Noonan for providing the cool beats that have been filling your ears in the intro and the outro. You can find links to him down below. And if you're in the Jersey area, either by Cream Ridge or Manahawken, go hit him up. As always, all of our episodes can be found on all of our social links down below, audio. We're making a bigger push for that. And if you want to hear the inner musings of our very own Kevin Gallagher, uh, link to his blog, which will be launching soon. Uh, keep an eye on that all of the links all the important stuff down below and uh, if you're potentially looking to maybe earn some money writing some articles uh, be, feel free to hit Kevin or myself up we're looking to start producing producing more written content I'm starting to get out of breath so I will sign off I have been Kevin Bradley and this has been Kevin Gallagher and you have been you And we are sorry that you've been stuck here with us, and we can't wait for you to get stuck once again inside Cave Guard. Good night.